Hey everybody. Today we're talking about the central limit theorem, possibly the most important theorem in all of statistics. Now, the CLT describes the shape of the sampling distribution of the sample mean x bar. So you really need to have a good understanding of what a sampling distribution is in order to understand the CLT. Um, I'll throw a link to my video on sampling distributions up top. If you need to, you should watch that before proceeding. So here's the CLT. We're imagining that we're taking simple random samples of size n from some population with mean mu and standard deviation sigma. Now we don't necessarily know anything else about the shape of that population. But if n is large and 30 is usually sufficient, then the sampling distribution of the sample mean has approximately a normal shape. If you're sampling from a population that is itself normal, then the sampling distribution of x bar is exactly normal, regardless of how large n is. Moreover, it's always the case that the mean of x bar is mu and the standard deviation of x bar is sigma over the square root of n. Again, where the mean and standard deviation of the population are mu and sigma respectively. Um, in short, the central limit theorem is saying that regardless of what population you're sampling from, if the sample size is large enough, the distribution of the sample mean x bar is going to be approximately n of mu comma sigma squared over n. So mentally, you should be imagining taking many, many different samples from this population, each of the same size, and taking a sample mean of each one. Sometimes those sample means will be a little higher, sometimes they'll be a little lower, but on average, they'll be exactly the mean of the population. And the spread of those sample means about that mean is going to be approximately bell-shaped with a standard deviation that is going to be related to but less than the standard deviation of the population. Let's do a specific example to try and make this clearer. The length of calls to a tech helpline have mean mu equal 2 minutes and standard deviation sigma equals 3 minutes. Now, by the way, we don't know anything else about the distribution of the lengths of calls to this um, helpline, just the mean and standard deviation. Find the probability that 40 randomly selected calls have a mean length less than 2.5 minutes. Now, we wouldn't be able to find the probability that an individual call is less than 2.5 minutes, simply because we don't know the exact distribution of the length of the calls. However, when we're looking at the mean of 40 calls, we can use the central limit theorem. We view these 40 calls as representing a simple random sample from the population of all calls to the center. And therefore, the sample mean x bar is going to be approximately normal. It's going to have mean 2, the same as mu, and standard deviation 3 over the square root of 40, sigma divided by the square root of n. So we need to find the probability of randomly getting an x bar value that's less than 2.5 in the distribution that's normal with mean 2 and standard deviation 3 over the square root of 40. So to find that probability, p that x bar is less than 2.5 in n of 2 comma 9 fortieths, variance is 9 fortieths because the standard deviation is 3 over the square root of 40, we compute a z-score. So in that distribution, 2.5 has z-score 2.5 minus 2 over 3 divided by the square root of 40, x minus the um, expected value over the standard deviation. And so we can do this using our um, normal CDF function. We need the probability that z is less than 1.05 in n of 0 comma 1. And that's about 85.3%. You could do that using a table. I, of course, recommend using technology. In R, for instance, the commands p norm of 1.05 and p norm of 2.5 comma 2 comma 3 over the square root of 40, both will do the job. Example 2 is a little bit of a demonstration. So imagine that you have a random number generator that's producing random integers from 1 to 12 with equal probability. Very roughly speaking, this is like picking somebody at random and finding out what month their birthday is. So the probability histogram for individual results is very blocky because 
every um, x value between 1 and 12 is going to have the same probability, namely 1 12. Now let's consider taking simple random samples of size 2. Run the random number generator twice and take the mean x bar. You're going to get a result, of course, between 1 and 12. Imagine doing that, though, a thousand times and then plotting the results into a histogram. I did that using technology and I got this, roughly a pyramid shape. So what we're seeing here is that um, when we do a sample of size 2 and take the average of the two random numbers, we're a lot more likely to get a number around 6.5 than we are, for example, close to 1 or 12, which I think makes sense if you think about it. Now let's repeat that exercise, but now with samples of size 10. Here are the results when, with 10,000 samples. I'm sorry, with 1,000 samples. The histogram is beginning to have a vaguely bell shape. Also notice the spread is starting to decrease. Now, nearly all the results are between 4 and 9. Now let's do 1,000 samples, all of size 100. Get 100 random numbers between 1 and 12, take the mean. Do it again, 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 1,000 times. Plot the results. Now, the shape is clearly um, bell-shaped. And now, most of the results lie between 6 and 7. The standard deviation of the sample mean is clearly shrinking. Finally, let's do samples of size 1,000. Now, a normal curve is going to fit this, uh, this plot exceptionally well. Additionally, notice that most of the results are going to lie between 6.25 and 6.75. Once again, we're seeing the standard deviation of the sample mean shrinking. Let's finish this example by actually computing the mean and standard deviation of each of these sampling distributions. If we randomly select a single number between 1 and 12, each one is going to have a probability of 1 12th of being picked, and we can use that fact to compute the mean and standard deviation just by using our usual formulas for mean and standard deviation of a discrete random variable. We get mu is 6.50, and sigma is about 3.45. Now, for any n, the mean and standard deviation of the sample mean are going to be mu and sigma over the square root of n, respectively. For example, when n is 2, the mean is still going to be 6.5, but the standard deviation of x bar is going to shrink to 2.44. Regardless of the n, that mu is going to stay the same, but as we start increasing n, we're going to see the standard deviation of x bar get less and less. When n is 10, the standard deviation of x bar is 1.09. When n is 100, it's 0.035. And when n is 1,000, it's 0.11. Roughly speaking, we interpret this to mean that as n increases, the sample mean x bar becomes a more reliable estimator of mu. There's less variability in that statistic. Example 3. A distilled water dispenser vends gallons of water according to a normal distribution with mean 1.03 gallons and standard deviation 0.02 gallons. So the amount it dispenses isn't going to be exactly a gallon every single time, even if you're pushing the button that says one gallon. It's in general going to give you a little bit more than you asked for, but occasionally it will give you less. First question is what's the probability that a single, quote, gallon, unquote, is actually under one gallon? And the second question is what's the probability that 10 gallons average less than a gallon apiece? For an individual gallon, we want the probability of drawing an x value less than 1 in the normal distribution with mean 1.03 and variance 0.02 squared, standard deviation 0.02. We compute a z-score for that. We do um, x equals 1 minus the mean 1.03 divided by the standard deviation 0.02, which is all equal to negative 1.50. We take the p-norm of that, the um, normal CDF of that, we get 6.68%. So it's uh, somewhat rare, a little less than 7%, but not unheard of. On the other hand, when n equals 10, the sample mean has distribution still with mean 1.03, um, now with variance 0.02 squared divided by 10, and is normal by the central, by the central limit theorem. 
The original distribution that we're sampling from is exactly normal in this case. So um, this distribution for X bar is not an approximate one anymore. It's exact. We want to find the probability of getting X bar less than 1 in this normal distribution. As always, we compute a z-score, the value we're interested in, 1, minus the mean of the sampling distribution of X bar, 1.03, divided by its standard deviation, sigma divided by the square root of n. Um, doing out that arithmetic, we get negative 4.74. Taking the normal CDF of that, we get 0.0001%. Our conclusion here is that while it's somewhat unlikely, less than 7%, that a single gallon will be underfilled, it would be extremely unusual if the mean of 10 gallons were less than 1. Now, one final comment about sample size. The central limit theorem says that the sampling distribution of x bar is approximately normal for large n and suggests that n equals 30 counts as large. Now, large isn't a very mathematical term. It's kind of vague. So let's take a second to unpack it. n equals 30 is a very conservative count in general. And it's only necessary to have a sample that large if the distribution that you're sampling from is pretty skewed. When you're sampling from a fairly um, symmetric distribution that does not have extreme outliers, a smaller n is going to be acceptable. We've already seen an example of this. When we were looking at that random number generator um, that was pulling random numbers between 1 and 12, even when we did samples of size n equals 10, we got a very normal shape already. It's rather jagged just because we did finite samples. In general, the more skewed the distribution that you're sampling from and the worse the outliers you have, the larger the sample you need in order for the central limit theorem to really kick in.